Okay, well, thank you, everyone. I appreciate you choosing me for having a reason to come back from lunch. That's uh, nice to know. Uh, just to introduce myself, my name's Phil Camillo. Um, these days I do agile coaching. I started off as a developer back in the day and worked my way through being a developer, software development manager, head of development. But for the last 20 years, I've really been focusing on helping teams and organizations work better, become more agile. But having said that, I'm now going to talk about why nobody needs an agile transformation. A little clickbaity, I know, but it got you all here, didn't it? So, first off, I thought about doing this, um, this uh, presentation when I was at the Agile on the Beach in 2019. And so it's gone through a few iterations and rethinks and whatever since then. But the essence of the whole thing comes down to this quote from Theodore Levitt. People don't want quarter-inch drills, they want quarter-inch holes. Yeah. It's all about the hole. So, just to clarify that a bit more. When I was sitting at the, uh, listen, lots of talks last, uh, two years ago, I was hearing lots and lots of, and lots of jargon. We have our own language in um, Agile. There are lots of words, and they mean lots of stuff to us but they don't really mean much to particularly the leadership and the organizations and aren't of a lot of interest to them. Uh, there's a little while ago, I did um, a, work, a project man, product management workshop for a bunch of senior stakeholders, and I used hardly any jargon. And at the end of it, they were saying, oh, could you do a glossary for us, please? Can you tell us what these words mean? And I was thinking, uh, you're, not, you're not quite getting it. You're not quite buying into it. So what's a different way of getting to this? So when it comes back to that holes quote, we are people are interested in drilling holes. That's what we're all about. But the people we're talking to are um, actually people who want the holes, and they're more interested in the hole. So this last bit of the front here is a heat map I ran on the, the program for the last Agile on the Beach. And it's all about doing stuff. It's about Agile. It's about words. It's about projects, programs, techniques, whatever. But if you think about what um, uh, Kevlin said yesterday, we tend to have forgotten the users. We tend to have forgotten the customer we we're aiming for. So this is trying to bring us back to that focus. So when a transformation starts, do they really start as a methodology or do they start as a cultural shift? If we look at this little cartoon here, this is what most organizations do. Oh, we're, going to be, we're going to be agile. We'll get one of our technical teams and we'll make them agile and they'll sit there in the tree and the rest of the organization will forget all about it. Uh, I've seen this all the time and those teams are set up to fail really because they can't interact with everyone else. What they need to do is have everyone that they make contact with, everyone they work with, uh, adopt the same beliefs and values and be prepared to support them. They may not be going fully agile but they need to understand they're working with an agile team and work to that team's culture. So we need to get that sort of thinking throughout the organization. So this is where we need to start talking much more cultural shift and getting away from the idea of processes, methodologies, and frameworks, which we tend to talk a lot about at a conference like this because it's a conference like this. The problem starts actually with a manifesto. It does itself no favors. It's in the title, isn't it? It's for Agile Software Development. So it's an IT methodology thing. It's in the opening phrase. We're uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping others do it. We could as easily say, we're finding a better way of drilling holes and doing it and helping others. So to take that a bit further, the whole story here, this highly scientific pie chart, the big yellow group are all the people in who want holes. And that tiny little gray area are the people who want to find better ways of drilling holes. It's a very small group. Now, this was exhaustively researched by me by reading an ad on the tube. This is a, a rental company in London. Some of you may have seen it. So they rent out things like drills, would you believe? So according to them, a drill is on average used for 15 minutes in its lifetime. So for five years, you're going to use that for three minutes a year. 
and with half a million households in central London, that kind of implies the whole of London only needs 2.8 drills, which I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, but it shows the lack of interest in drilling holes and the massive interest in actually having holes. You know, people want holes. <laughs> so what we might be better off saying is we're uncovering better ways of achieving outcomes by doing it and helping others, rather than actually thinking about working software or drilling holes or whatever. Focus on the outcomes. And this will tie into some of the stuff you've heard in some of the other talks over the last couple of days. So, this is not our drill. We are not at drilling on the beach. We're agile on the beach. So we're talking agile here. Now, as agile practitioners, keeping that metaphor going a bit, we tend to value the drill over the hole. We're interested in looking at better ways of drilling, better ways of thinking about this stuff, better ways of delivering. Our customers, though, they value the hole over the drill. The difficult bit really comes in the kind of leadership management level. We tend to find they value the drill over the hole. I think there's a couple of reasons for that. Let's bring on Dilbert. So Dilbert, yeah. Agile is a cool word. It's got lots of marketing buzz around it. People like to say, we're an agile organization. We're an agile team. We do things agilely without really meaning knowing what it means or actually doing it. But it's good for them to say, and it's good to spin. So that's a popular word. Our strategy is to be nimble and agile. What on earth does that mean? Yeah, it's certainly the opposite of clumsy and slow. You wouldn't want to say you're clumsy and slow, but otherwise, what's it telling you? We need to be looking at strategies that are much more relevant and get away from the drilling of the hole and talk about the actual hole itself. The other thing is, it's quite easy to look at a process, to measure a process, to look at the outputs, and you feel like you're doing something. We've got these numbers, we've got this stuff. But the trouble with numbers, in this Deming quote, which I'm sure you've seen before, give a manager a numerical target and he'll make it. Even you have to destroy the company in the process. Yeah. So I've got an example of that. It was the early 2000s. Um, a company was set up, um, I'll give the names of it all away, but they were set up to deliver UK-based e-learning to the rest of the world. And I was working with the, um, the prime contractor they used. And we found we'd, we'd have you know, a meeting a week with this client, and they were obsessed with the platform we were delivering them. Now, looking back on it, early 2000s, we didn't have the tech then that you, we have today. You know, E-learning seems a straightforward thing today. It wasn't back then. So they were very focused on how's this going to work? What's the, how are you going to deliver to scope? How are you going to deliver the cost? How are you going to deliver on the deadline? What's the quality going to be like? All this sort of stuff. They were obsessed with it, and they tried to micromanage us massively, following all these numbers, lots of meetings, lots of conversations. Then the company folded. And that was just as we were delivering the platform. The company folded not because of anything to do with the platform, but because really no one in that organization was out there looking for customers. They were going to get a platform, and they had no one to use it. No one's paying money to go on this platform. So they did exactly what Deming says here. They destroyed the company by being obsessed with making numbers. Another example that leads on from this, the way we motivate people and challenge people. So I used to be software development manager for a company in San Jose in the States. Yeah. This was back in the 90s. And we had a product that, anyone remembers these things, ran on platforms like um, Unix and VMS. Uh, but it was a time, the early 90s, mid 90s, PCs were starting to appear on everyone's desks outside of the IT department. So what the company wanted was a PC client for their product. So they told me and my team, if you deliver a PC product to us, we will give you a bonus. You need to deliver it in six months. That's what the leadership asked for. 
Okay, sounds straightforward so far. So we did it. Six months later, we gave them a PC product. Very happy with that. Except the management went. It's not what we wanted. It may be what we wanted six months ago, but we realized it's not actually what we wanted. So because it's not what we wanted, we are not going to give you a bonus either. Which left us with a pretty unhappy team, as you might imagine. What they asked for was a PC client. Okay? That's what they told us they wanted, and that's what we delivered. If they thought about it, what they actually needed was their customers wanted a similar experience on the PC when the PC client came, on the VMS systems, on the Unix systems. What they really needed, when you look back on it, was a web client. But they had focused totally on a technical solution, not a business outcome. So the reason we failed to deliver what they wanted was because they weren't thinking about the business outcome. They weren't thinking about what they needed to achieve. So we were very aligned in that point. We had been, the entire organization was aligned. The, from the leadership down, we wanted to deliver a PC client. Me, my team, we were all very aligned because we were going to get a big bonus in six months' time if we did exactly what they asked for. So off we went. What we went was autonomous. Innovation was actively discouraged because we were being bonus driven to deliver something. Yeah? We were being told, you must deliver a PC client in six months. So we weren't going to do anything that would put that at risk. We weren't going to go and innovate anything. We just needed to achieve that, to achieve our bonus. Looking back on it, it's not a very um, healthy way to work. But when we were in the agile world, we were then looking at autonomy as well. Now, what autonomy does without the alignment can result in chaotic innovation, which can be great for an entrepreneurial startup where you're looking for lots of smart ideas. And let's, let's get something radical out there and let's just try stuff. But in large organizations, you really need that innovation to be aligned with what you're trying to get, what the overall outcomes of the organization are. So we need to hit that sweet spot in the center. And that sweet spot gives us focused innovation. Yeah? We're, we're, we know what we're trying to achieve. We're aligned to do that. And um, it fits in with the, the overall outcomes, but we're not being told what to deliver. So you guys know how to do the work. You know what you're working with. You know the technologies. Give us something great, but it needs to achieve this outcome. So autonomy with alignment lets the organization innovate around the overall goals we're trying to achieve. So the question then is, how do we do it? So we need to focus on the outcomes, not the outputs. I've used this word a few times. You'll have heard it in other talks over the last couple of days. The idea is to think about what does the business need rather than what does the team need to deliver. Why do outcomes matter? matter? Well, try asking the patient. Doesn't matter how good the, um, the doctor's been, they don't make it through. It's pointless. And going back to the drilling analogy, What's the point in having an expertly drilled half-inch hole if what your customer wants is a quarter-inch hole that's not done so well? Yeah. It's really getting that focus on what is going to keep your business going and keep your business focused. So, yeah, the culture needs to move to one of thinking and talking outcomes, talking with the leadership about what outcomes are, what they want the, the organization to achieve, and not what they want the organization to deliver. So how do we get to an outcome? We split it into three points. We have a goal. The goal defines what the outcome is we want to achieve. We have a strategy, which is kind of, how are we going to get to that goal? What's the technique we're going to use? And we have metrics that tell us how we're approaching that goal. Um, a few talks over the last few days have been about OKRs. People know what OKRs are? Anyone that come across it? Okay, it's something called an outcome key result. It's a really old technique. It actually came out in the, in the 50s and was known as management by objectives. And it's an 
evolved over time and it got a lot more popularity once Google said they were using it in the late 90s, early 2000s. So an OKR is an outcome key result. Um, so that is saying what is an outcome, the goal, how are we going to get there, the strategy, and how do we know we've got there? It's the metrics. The challenge here, the biggest challenge, is what do you actually need to know? What you're looking for? How do you work that out? It's one thing to come up with the, the goal and the strategy to get there, but how do you know you've got there? It's so tempting to fall back into measuring outputs. So I'd like to use three questions here. First of all, what, what do you want to know? You know? What is it as a leadership team uh, you actually want to know about this delivery? Why do you want to know it? You know, what are you hoping to get out of it? And once you know it, how are you going to use that? If you haven't got a good answer to the last question, let's iterate. And we'll do the five whys and keep going through this. Now, metrics can be quite dangerous. You've got a tool like Jira, it gives you bucket loads of metrics. All sorts of things, you can report on everything, and it can get you into mess because you're just looking at all the wrong things, and you don't know, it's a can't see the wood for the trees type scenario. So let me give you an example. Oh, a number of years back, uh, I was working with an organization, and I talked to one of the project managers, and he was not happy. He wasn't happy because uh, he wanted to know how many hours were spent on each story that the team was delivering. Great. And what made him really unhappy was the team were kind of doing this. So putting their time in their timesheets and they were putting time in Jira. And he wasn't happy because the times in Jira didn't match the times in the timesheets. My reaction to this was, why on earth did you ever think they would? Yeah. I know it's like filling in timesheets, you make the numbers up and you don't remember what they are when you came to Jira. Um, so it's kind of, well, I'm trying to understand why, why do you actually want to do this? What's, what's the point? Um, the point was driven by the fact that teams weren't uh, delivering many stories. The stories just weren't getting to done. But when I drill this a bit further, I said, you know, why do you want to know, why, why do you really want to know this? It was because I want to know I'm in control. If I've got these numbers, I know I'm in control. So immediately we're in a control, command and control type of conversation. And you get to the last question, how can you use it once you know it? Well, there's no constructive answer there. Basically, he was just going to moan that the dev's estimates were rubbish. And guess what? The devs already knew that. They already knew their, their estimates didn't mean much. So that was an interesting conversation that pulled out the cultural driver behind him, that need to feel in control without really you understanding what he was trying to get out of it. He had a question and it assumed an answer and then wanted to give that control. We'll come back to that story later and how it played out. The thing with metrics is things like velocity, um, throughput, cycle times are really useful to delivery teams to help them understand how they can improve and the tools to use in retrospectives and them to inwardly look and say how we're we working. They're not useful for management and leadership to, to micromanage. The management and leadership need their own metrics. So they should be looking at the metrics in the OKR and saying, how are we performing on delivering these outcomes? Not how, we were, how are our teams performing delivering what we've asked them to deliver, to deliver these outcomes. Does that make sense to everyone? So let's get some examples up here. So I went onto the Atlassian site and found, well, actually, we'll jump there. This year's been popular for space tourism. There's been a lot of talk about that. We've got the Mars Discovery rover, we've got Virgin Galactica, and we've got Jess Bezos's thing up there. And um, I found on Atlassian, there's some nice examples of OKRs for space tourism. So they've got an organization, they want to grow space tourism. So at the top level, they want to increase the subscription cohort for Mars travelers. They want more people flying to Mars on holiday. 
Um, and they, so how they want to do this is increase the revenue from travellers who s subscribe to annual space flights. And their measure is a 30% increase in revenue. So that's a clear outcome that can be measured and can be seen. Then you start to decompose that at the next level down. What's the strategy we might try and do there? We want to offer the best flight experience in the market. And that, if we can do that, we'll get more people signing up to second and third flights, because most of our flights so far are just the first flights. We want them to come back, we want return business. So we're looking to improve our net promoter score from 15 to 25. So social media type measure of interest. So if we can do that, then again, we've achieved that outcome. We've set ourselves a goal, we've achieved it. Then the last one, this is one that could be down at the team level. It's kind of, how do we give that best flight experience in the market? So I say, actually, we know the landing experience isn't great. We know we need to improve our landing gear. So let's deliver uh, a, la a 2.0 launch, sorry, set of landing gear. And that will make our experience less turbulent and faster. And what we're looking to do here is get a reduction in detractor comments. So you've got another clear measure. Okay, so any observations on those three OKRs? Anyone see anything interesting about them? Hmm? Yeah, yeah. Sorry? Oh, for talking to asking themselves, yeah. That's true. That is true. <laughs> true, I missed them out, didn't I? I forgot them. That's careless of me. Uh, yeah, and specifically about the OKRs themselves, anything you'd observe on them? They all have a number. Yep, they all have a number. Anything about that number? The thing about the number is none of those numbers relate to the delivery team. They're not tracking a project, they're not tracking a program, they're not tracking work. They're tr tracking successful outcomes. Anything else you've noticed there? Okay, the other one is there's nothing there that specifies the solution. We're leaving the solution to the technical team. These are all business outcomes that we're trying to achieve. Now, so for the next example, let's bring in the C word, COVID. So let's use this as an example. So a little while ago, I saw that headline on the BBC. COVID-19, more than 75% of the UK adults are now double jabbed. Great. Anyone think that isn't a good outcome? In the context of an OKR, I would say it isn't. Because what you're doing there is measure, measuring a strategy. You're measuring how well the strategy is going. You're measuring how many needles you're getting in people's arms. That's not really an outcome in itself. If you think of what the government was trying to achieve, their goal was to ensure the NHS wasn't overwhelmed. That was the outcome that needed to be achieved. A vaccination program was a strategy. They had other strategies. We had the lockdowns. We had um, masks. Um, what else? We had the Nightingale hospitals and so on. There were various strategies, all aiming to ensure that the NHS wasn't overwhelmed. So the metric needed to be that the hotel, hotel? <laughs> hospital admissions due to COVID-19 remain below a threshold. So again, that's, that vaccination program is not an outcome in itself. There's, I'm not anti-vax, totally pro-vax, but that's not a measure in itself. It's only if it leads to the hospital admission staying low that it's succeeded. So, just a little slide. It's really not about how many arrows we managed to stick in people's arms. It's about have we hit the goal? Have we got there? So this often comes, conversations often happens with agile teams. We shouldn't be measuring the work. We should be measuring the value, the outcome we're trying to get to. And that's what this is um, all about here. It's not how hard the team are working, how many stories they're delivering. It's are we actually hitting the business goals? Is this 
adding value to the business. So has this look in practice? Outcomes will lead to outputs. So we have um, a set of outcomes, and these are owned by the leadership. This is what we need to encourage our leadership to be telling us about. We have a set of outputs which are owned by the delivery team. So the, um, the delivery team, so the leadership has a vision. So let's go back to the COVID example. The vision is we're not going to um, uh, overwhelm the NHS. They'll have a number of different strategies for actually implementing this. So let's go back to the vaccination program, to lockdowns, to Nightingale hospitals. Each of those will be a piece of work that needs to be delivered. So that then comes across to the delivery team. And then we get into our familiar language of Agile, where you might have a set of epics, which leads to a prioritized backlog of work, uh, which can be easily helped for the product owner and team to prioritize by the leadership having prioritized the delivery of the, um, the initiatives they've got. So we didn't prioritize the vaccination program until we'd actually got a, a likelihood of a viable vaccine. But we went straight into social distancing. Early, early on, we went into lockdown. So it's a priority order to that. And that then gives us, in our lang agile language, product increments and leading to value. So that's great. We have now a strategy. We can see a process by which this could work and can flow down into the teams. But there's a problem. And that problem is this Peter Drucker quote that you've also probably seen before. Culture eats strategy for breakfast. Whatever our strategy is, when we're trying to introduce it into our organisation, it's going to change because of the culture. And the culture will change because of the strategy. We have a feedback loop here that we need to think about and how, that, how we need to um, engage with that feedback loop and how we need to change the culture to be able to support this outcome versus output model. There's an interesting document that's been produced every year since the mid-90s called the Standish Chaos Report. Have people come across this? I use it all the time. It's, it's, it's great, isn't it? It's great. So this list here, basically what they do is each year they talk to CIOs of tech companies and, and try to understand how many of their projects were successful, how many were challenged, how many failed. And then of the projects that were successful, what were the success factors? So this is the top 10 here, okay? If we look at these top three, we have executive sponsorship. That's engagement from the executive. That's interest. It's not micromanagement, but they're actively engaged and interested in what's happening. We have um, emotional maturity. It's all the stuff that Gitter was talking about this morning. Psychological safety, trust, empowerment. Have you got, an, is your environment a safe space where people feel comfortable working, enjoy working, and feel free to innovate and experiment? And user involvement, actually getting those users we've forgotten about into the process and actually engaged early on. All three of those are culture related. They have nothing to do with technology. They have nothing to do with process. The top three factors for successful deliveries are cultural. If we look a little lower down, We've got agile process right down there. The process is subservient to the culture. It's not that important. Get the right culture in place, the right process will fall out. And interestingly, way down at the bottom, we have clear business objectives. Okay? It's, it's understood that these, are, these aren't outcomes. These are the objectives that fall out of the strategies. Okay? These will evolve and emerge throughout the delivery. And even the outcomes might change, but it's understood. The objectives you go into this process with aren't necessarily the objectives you deliver at the end. So they're way down on the list of success factors. So I use the word objectives. Let's have a think about objectives and the cultural impact of objectives. And this is stuff that um, Steve talked about in the day yesterday when we were talking about um, performance reviews and such like. So this was an organization I worked with again a few years back. They had an objective where a model, objectives model, where objectives drive the level of bonus that um, developers would receive. Yeah? There's a financial incentive to meeting your objectives. 
And they set one as a standard. As a developer, your objective is to deliver X stories into test within Y sprints. So it's quite a traditional model, development into test, okay? Think about this from the smart. Specific, yeah, it's pretty precise there what we're asking them to do and measure. Measurable, X, Y, it's measurable. Achievable, if the developer signs up to it, then they're saying, you know, I can achieve this, this is fine. Relevant, as long as those stories are prioritized, then they're, they're totally relevant. And timely, well, we have Y sprints, so it's timely. Right, perfect, look at that. What could possibly go wrong? Anyone want to make a suggestion what actually went wrong? Well, the premise suggests that is a leadership on the approach of the team, and B is a leadership on the approach of the system, and so that's what was going wrong. That's a high level one, yep, yeah, I'm looking at a lower level one. Yeah? Put question, it's easy to do. Sorry, the mask was... Put question, that it's easy to do, that yeah. the delivery took this bottle, but didn't let you into the barrel. Yep, that's a good point. Okay, let's show you what actually happened. So what they weren't doing was visualizing their work at all. So, got a simple Kanban board built up which reflected the way they work. Take something off a list, work on it, give it to test, okay? And put in some queuing states as well. So, the developer would pull a story into development. Okay? When they'd finished it, they'd put it in ready for test. And then the tester would pull it in, Developer would pull in another story into development. Some more stories would go on the backlog. Then the developer would finish that story, and they'd pull in another story. While that's happening, there's a critical bug in the first story. So this critical bug came in because the developer wasn't motivated or prioritized on quality. They just had to get stories into test. So that one suddenly stuck. So the next thing that happens is the tester pulls in another story into test. And some more stories go on the backlog. That next story then gets blocked as well. Okay, so we're a bit stuck now. So remember I talked earlier about um, the project manager is trying to work out why stories weren't getting done. This turned out to be the reason. The, um, the objective that was set for the developers was causing them to overload the test team and give them, put them in a position where they were blocked. So what happens here then is, first of all, the testers get the blame immediately for not delivering because the work's stuck with them, isn't it? Um, team sex success gets devalued in favor of a hero culture. What then happens is the developer has to come in and fix all these bugs. Hero, for fixing all these bugs. Everyone kind of forgets that's the person who put the bug in there in the first place. And it encourages silos. It, it builds a silo between dev and test, particularly when the testers are getting blamed for this stuff. And it's the, uh, it's the quality of what they're receiving. So quality is also diminished. Yeah. So what we see here is a big impact on the culture of the organization, which is being driven through, um, through personal objectives. So we need to take this big holistic view of culture and also consider Whoops, I've forgotten there was another one there. It, it keeps going. Okay, um, there, think about unintended outcomes. Yeah, I love Dilbert. Dilbert is just a documentary on our world. Yeah, think, you have to think through what, what could go wrong if I'm doing this. So we need to get to thinking much more in this case about you know, team-based behavior, not individual behavior. Think about, you know, We'd be much better off rewarding the team for getting stories signed off by the product owner and getting into done and have them collaborate as a team rather than this cultural split, which was in that case I looked at. Because what happens then is they come out of this line. Agile doesn't work for us. Yeah, I've heard that so many times. It doesn't work because they're not embracing the cultural change that needs to happen. And they're not thinking outcome. They're focusing on this, what can we measure? What can we report on that's measurable? So, Agile, are you faking it? Remember this? So that's certainly faking it down the bottom there. In that same product management workshop I, was, um, I mentioned earlier, 
I was asked by a senior, senior stakeholder, well, how do we make cultural change happen? So, because I was an external consultant, I could say to him, it's all about you. It's, you're the person who needs to make this happen. It comes down to you know, what you say, what you do. Do you do what you say? Are you encouraging others? Are you making this happen? You can't just expect a team down at the bottom there to bring about cultural change without the organisation. It has to be something that's driven that way down to the team. Yeah. So the, for, it, for, for cultural change to be real, it has to be embraced by and driven by the leadership team. If they don't buy in, people will just say, I've heard this so many times from teams, yeah, we need a cultural change, but it's not going to happen. They won't do that in this place. So we have to get to the leadership, talk to the leadership about the need for cultural change. An aspect of cultural change, okay, it's all about people, isn't it? Culture is all about people, and we value individuals and interactions over processes and tools. And yet, very, places I've been, very few places I've been to actually think about it from this aspect. The point I've made here, buying Jira doesn't buy cultural change. All you're doing is getting a tool and following a process. I would like to see HR much more involved. I've been to a couple of talks by HR on Agile and what they do, and it's all about recruiting people. It's all about recruiting people faster, bringing people into the building faster. And I've asked questions in sessions, those sessions about, well, how about other aspects of HR? What do you do there in an Agile way? And just get blank looks. And again, this is the leadership aren't engaging those. But if we think about being people over process, HR is what that's all about. So we could be working with HR to look at how do we create a non-hierarchical organisation? How do we develop people's careers in non-hierarchical organisations? How do we assess and reward people without creating that hero culture I was talking about earlier? How do we identify people in the recruitment process or foster that culture when they come in? And how do we create collaborative working environments Particularly important now when we work from home, we'll have hybrid models. Yeah, we have to get HR involved. If you went to Steve's talk yesterday about um, personal objectives, saying some of this was having to go under the radar to avoid HR. We want HR on our side. We need them playing this game as well. But again, this comes back right to the top. It has to be a message from the top to the, to the organisation saying this is how we work. You guys need to support this way, this way of working as we move forward. So HR really can be a force for change, but they rarely actually get used for that. But be careful. We don't want to end up with this. Everything is agile. Everyone, the organization's the same, but everyone's got agile in the job title. We're clearly an agile organization, aren't we? Everyone's agile. So nothing is agile. So what we're trying to do here really is get our leadership to lead that cultural um, transformation, empowering the delivery teams to self-organize, self-manage, and innovate. And um, that means uh, pushing the ownership down through from leadership, bypassing effectively the management layer straight into the teams, getting those teams self-empowered um, and organized without accidentally doing this. Bring Dilbert back in again. That's really not what it's all about. So we need, to get our, we need to actually develop our leaders to make this happen. We need to be getting in there at the highest level in the organisations, talking to senior leaders about what we need to happen here. So the leaders need some education. Now, quite often when you go and talk to leaders about Agile and I'd like to take you through the Agile process and understand what Agile is all about, you get blank looks and they switch off and they're not interested. You have to find out what their problems are. What are the problems they've got? Then if you can start offering them some solutions to those problems, they'll get engaged. They'll start understanding it. And you can do that a lot with outcomes. Start talking about, you know, what are you actually trying to achieve here? How can we help you deliver on what you want to achieve? Yeah, so the, the couple of questions I usually ask of stakeholders is, okay, what concerns have you got about us going agile from what you know of it? What are the problems you're hitting? Where can we help you? 
and then really focus on that kind of work. There's a nice quote here from Simon Sinek about leadership. If we look at the things it focuses on, it's about not thinking you're the most important, important person in the room, not thinking you're in charge. You're facilitating things. You're empowering people. You're giving people a goal, presenting a world that doesn't exist yet that you want them to get to and encourage them to take you there. So we need people who are called transformational leaders, people who focus on strategy, tactics, and culture. The strategy being you know, that inspiring future of the vision of the future. This is where we want to get to. Focusing very much on the realization of outcomes, not the measurement of outputs. Um, getting their team to buy into and deliver that vision. Get them excited, get them to feel part of it. Get them to contribute to it and innovate within it and facilitate the delivery of that vision. That's not managing it, that's making sure they have all the support and tooling and people they need to actually achieve it. And cultural trust, building trusted relationships, empowerment. Yeah. So it's those three things that come together to um, create a transformational leader. And that's what we want to encourage our leaders or the people in the room who are leaders to actually be. So just to quickly summarize this, First of all, our customers want outcomes, not processes. They do not care about the process, yeah? No interest whatsoever. They want holes. They don't want to be told about drilling holes. Agile is not itself, agility itself is not an outcome, yeah? It's a delivery mechanism to get to an outcome. It's just a tool that gets us there. It may be a mindset cultural change tool rather than a physical tool, but it's still a tool to get somewhere. Strategies deliver outcomes, not outputs. Okay, so the leadership needs to be thinking about measuring the success of outcomes, whereas the delivery teams are looking at the rate of delivery of outputs. And they both need to think about themselves as individual teams and use the metrics that help their team to improve. So with the, our measurements, the stuff we want to measure, it's the realization of the outcomes, the delivery of outputs. And those outcomes come from the leadership to the team and they set that cultural change. Yeah. Outcomes lead to alignment. As I talked about earlier, we had that thing with the PC clients. We were totally aligned because we set a very clear outcome. It was the wrong outcome, but it was a very clear one. Uh, but real change comes from individuals here. Okay. Um, so cultural change responsible to the leadership. We get individuals' interactions driving the cultural change. And as a last step, we need to actually make that cultural change we need to make a move from operational management to transformational management. Yeah, that's the big thing to get here, is get those leaders thinking differently, thinking outcomes, thinking about transforming culture, and not leaving that to, to it being an IT, IT methodology. So with that, thank you very much for your time, a virtual handshake. And if we go on that